uh, presentation, which is the technical process. Um, I'd like to introduce Ian Sinclair. He is a professional engineer. He divides his time between the building energy and education fields. Ian focuses on the existing buildings and renewable energy sectors. He has completed numerous multifamily building studies and retrofit projects from solar thermal retrofits to electric vehicle charging to deep green building renewal studies. Ian teaches water footprinting, energy management and multi-sector carbon mitigation strategies at University of Toronto and Metropolitan Toronto University. Welcome Ian. Thank you, Beata. That was um, <clears throat> that was a, a a good segue for Toronto Metropolitan University. I just started teaching a course there yesterday, and realized that every single piece of material I have from the previous engagement has to be changed by name. So things never stay the same. Okay, um, I am uh, going through a walkthrough of what we're calling a technical process, but really it's about. Uh, helping an organization understand the best way to step its way from start to finish uh, from an aspiration to a definable outcome. And if we're talking about buildings, energy and water, obviously the first thing you've got to do is to figure out what it is that you're actually trying to accomplish. It's then really important to understand what you do and don't have internally in terms of uh, technical and human resource. We're then going to have a quick look at potential ways of working your way through an energy and water retrofit project, then how you go about hiring a specifically a professional and, non and a, I want to say non-professional and um, trade resources, which then wraps into procurement at the end of uh, the process. So there are obviously multiple reasons as to why it is that you've either defined that you have a problem or even that you uh, showed up at the presentations today, which are almost self-explanatory from the screen. I think in um, Ontario in particular, we have a, an interesting uh, building sector in that we've got a ton of buildings of a certain age. Lots of them have equipment that needs replacing. Uh, building envelopes really weren't constructed to deal with the climate that we have and definitely not for the climates that are coming and that's also a technical issue. So there can be obvious we have a problem and we need to fix it or something keeps breaking down and we need to replace it but at the same time uh, financial pressures are there but uh, equally a financial pressure may actually be the opposite which is a financial opportunity in that you have access to some funding and you think you'd like to uh, spend money while it's available because these things come and go. And then increasingly uh, policy mandates, um, carbon reduction, uh, energy reductions are becoming um, much, more, uh, much more common than they have been in the past. In summary, no two buildings are the same and the irony is that's true both technically uh, and operationally. But you can um, solve a lot of problems by having a, a broad and, and I would guess diverse process for proceeding with your building. And obviously when we're thinking about both carbon reduction, so specifically we're really talking about elimination of natural gas from our energy footprints. And then secondarily, this kind of creeping requirement for air conditioning may drive you in a direction that you weren't necessarily thinking about um, five years ago and we're really starting to talk about uh, heat pumps as this potential solution to both in uh, carbon energy and um, comfort changes. So, <clears throat> excuse me, internally, I think we can divide this into uh, initially into two steps, human and information. When you're talking about doing a potentially a, a a deep or a um, multi-pronged energy water retrofit project in an existing building, that's a complex series of steps which requires project management skills. And those project management skills are both human, uh, but also uh, financial and contracting. So, you know, what do you have internally? Who, who is going to manage this project? Do they have time? What are the expectations? You've obviously got both internal and external uh, technical um, partnerships, resources, 
you know, at its simplest, you've got um, uh, uh, sub trades or professional technical resources on staff. But equally, uh, any building owner is going to have a series of existing relationships related to contracting services, uh, which will, which can and will be useful to you. And then obviously, we have those professional services, you're going to be looking at um, legal accounting, uh, and I guess technical as well. And on the information uh, side, pretty much any building is going to have some uh, a number of uh, either reserve fund studies or building condition assessments. As, a, as, a, as an often external service provider, it's always nice to walk into a building and find that somebody else has crawled around the mechanical uh, room and um, summarized the sizing, age and details of all the pumps, for example. Uh, equally, somebody who's coming fresh to your building is going to be asking for copies of drawings. They're going to be wanting to access maintenance records. If you have a building automation system and you're thinking about um, an energy retrofit project in the next uh, short or even medium term, using that automation system to start running trends and uh, plotting performance could provide extremely useful data for an internal uh, an external service provider coming in. Then obviously you may or may not have some money, you may or may not have some access to grants, loans, financing. But I think equally as important is that everybody exists within a community. There will be other building organizations with similar situations to yours. They may be the same operation type, they may be of the same size, age or vintage, they may be geographically close to you. Reach out to those people to find out what they've done, why they did it, how things went, you know, what were the cautionary tales that they learned. And then finally, you know, depending on the nature of, of your organization, you may find that you've got uh, supportive or you know, even a technically or financially skilled residents that you can lean on for advice or support, or if nothing else, just to, to provide some um, internal validation to what you potentially as a management or as a management component of a building uh, may bring to the table. So which ways are there of proceeding if you've decided that you want to go ahead with an energy and water retrofit project? I'd say on the, uh, on the left-hand side here, we've really got three potential routes in. That's going uh, via a contractor, so that's hiring somebody who's going to actually uh, do the work themselves. Number two is to go with a consultant or professionally led service who's somebody that, uh, I'm going to talk about each one of these individually, so I won't dig in now. And then lastly, a service provider, so somebody who's going to come in and offer a suite of services as opposed to one of the other two. And then as you proceed with that work, you can obviously go step by step. You may choose that you've got in enough, um, you've accumulated enough uh, issues requiring resolution, meaning that you uh, want to do everything at once. And really, we're talking about going step by step or a big jump in. Again, we've talked about heat pumps adding heat pumps to a building relatively um, invasive and expensive. But if you've got a poor, poorly performing building envelope and you're looking at doing some reinsulation or some ceiling or some window replacement, you do that, you reduce your building load, reducing your building load reduces your uh, future uh, heating and cooling requirements. That therefore means you have a smaller heat pump system. You know, I think we're familiar with uh, measures that can be interrelated. So let's look at the good and the, uh, I'm going to say, I was going to say the good, the bad and the ugly, but we'll go with the good and the risky. So if you're looking at going via an existing or a, or a future relationship, which I'm going to call contractor led, and that may be both a service provider and uh, sorry, uh, uh, somebody who's going to physically come in and do the work, but also be, may be representing a specific piece of technology. If this is uh, something that's already related to what you're doing, then the chances are you may be initially reaching out to somebody that has a good, un, uh, who knows your building or knows your building staff, which is obviously a good thing. They uh, should be familiar with the product that we're talking about or, the, or the, the type of intervention that we're talking about. And therefore there's a decent chance that it's gonna work well. And obviously somebody who is used to doing installation work is going to be pretty good at getting you a fairly accurate price. And in these times of con uh, construction inflation, that's uh, significantly more important than maybe it has been in the past. I was explaining to my class yesterday that for literally the first time in history, the solar PV market is experiencing cost inflation. It's been reducing in uh, price since the 1950s, and it, it, it changes everybody's focus in terms of understanding 
uh, the durability of a price. What are the downsides? Well, obviously, if you only if you're if you're a boiler expert, then the only thing you're going to recommend is a boiler. One of my favorite phrases: every problem is a nail looking for a hammer. And then these types of organizations are potentially less used to quantifying energy and water savings or carbon savings, and these can be things that that are increasingly important in terms of um, defining the success or outcome or even getting you over the start line. So that's something to consider. On the consulting side, um, I've got an inherent bias here. So obviously everything is peachy when you go with a consultant. So the good news is your consultant has seen more than one type of nail in their time and they maybe even own a drill. They may have looked at residential, non-residential. They may have different experiences of different types of equipment they really should be working directly for you in which case their advice should be impartial and that can be really important and then if you've got somebody that's got some good experience and obviously they're going to bring an understanding of a broader picture an understanding of what good processes look like so when they approach you as a new client you would hope that that person is going to be able to go through some kind of kind of technical and human resources assessment to say well i think we should go in this direction this direction and this direction the bad news is well um, you don't want to hire a, um, a, an energy consultant to do any hammering in your house because you'll get blood on the walls when they hit their thumb. It's also you know, just practically harder for a consultant-based organization to get hold of pricing because it requires going out to the contracting market and essentially asking for a favor. And I'm sure there are lots of sectors where for every uh, 10 prices that you give out, only one of them ever comes to a project. Which therefore, and which therefore means that the pricing that you've got is not necessarily as certain as it otherwise could be. As for service providers, there are multiple types that, that we can look at. Uh, Matt alluded to a number of these earlier, but somebody may be coming into our offer to manage your utilities. Somebody may be coming in with a chunk of money saying, let me, let me spend this for you. Somebody may come in and say, let me own some of your assets. We've talked about the ESCO model. It's really important internally to understand what each of those service provisions means to your organization and whether it actually fits from a procedural, from a human resources, from a longevity perspective. Um, hiring somebody that's going to be coming in is going to take time. You know, Matt's uh, casually talking about 10, 20, 30 year relationships. It's really important to understand that that longevity has a very long tail to it you need to make sure that the nature of your asset ownership of your operation suits that long-term perspective. It, uh, on the whole, the longer term you can think generally, uh, you would think that the better that is when we're dealing with interventions that don't necessarily immediately uh, result in a 50% return on investment where things do pay out over life cycles. Um, so how can we go about doing this work? Well, I've really breaking this into two technical processes. I think the most familiar one is, well, I, I think we'd like to say some energy, so let's go and let's hire an energy auditor. That energy auditor is gonna deliver you a feasibility study. They're gonna come in with a blend of, well, it's cold on the third floor and that's because the radiator valve is broken. So we're gonna recommend uh, re uh, fixing all of your, or replacing all of your radiator valves. Uh, they may be just looking at wholesale equipment replacement. They may be able to come in and um, find, for example, fundamental issues of pumping or piping that, that can solve heating or cooling distribution problems. A mixture of problem solving, a mixture of quantification and a mixture of upgrades. And again, you'd hope that they don't just ignore the, uh, uh, the big issue that you've already had. They come in and they solve it holistically. And then to define what they're giving you, really, that feasibility study should be what we can consider to be a 25% completion of engineering plus or minus, which I'd like to call a concept design engineering document. So something, you know, hopefully it's not that thick because you'll never read it, but that summary should give you a pretty decent idea of how much you're going to spend and what the positive outcomes would be. The other way, which is often suited to people with shorter time horizons or for people who uh, whose buildings could be in really terrible shape. Um, nothing is working properly. Everybody's complaining. And building recommissioning is, is recommissioning is really defined as a lower intervention approach. Uh, I used to work with a uh, wonderful fellow who would say, he defined it as to say, make your building the best that it can be. And I define that as 
an energy audit, an energy implementation process with one hand tied behind your back. So no, you can't go in and, and drop that lovely new boiler in. But what you can do is make those existing boilers that you have function as, uh, as, as well as they possibly can, get a contractor in, do the combustion testing, make sure that the airflows are correct. And then right size, repair, recalibrate and plan for the future. You know, buildings, uh, buildings often get adapted for reuse, walls get moved. Do air handling systems today correspond to the usage that they had when the building was initially put in place? Are you providing the right volumes? Uh, you know, ventilation has obviously been a huge issue going forward uh, in, you know, both in the last couple of years and going forward. And in terms of what the intervention looks like, what you're really doing is you're getting a combination of a consultant and a, and a contractor who are working together to define a scope of work and, and then are looking to do these low level um, implementations. And if you're interested in recommissioning, NRCAN actually has a very good guide that you can spend a day or a week uh, working your way through. So let's uh, quickly look at how we go about hiring these people. Now, it's important to understand that um, you need, to understand, you need to know what it is that you're trying to procure when you go out and look for a, for a, a, a professional a consultant or an engineering company. What is it that they're going to give you? If you don't understand, if you don't define that scope of work early on, then you could be disappointed that re, with the results that you get. There is absolutely nothing worse than going through an entire process only for the line to say requires further study or Pricing does not include dot, 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 when that was precisely the thing that you thought you were going to get in the first place. And again, going out and hiring some of these resources, um, the solar thermal industry, for example, is littered with poorly performing assets. Why? Because the procurement process of that organization, particularly in the public sector, required them to go with traditional uh, mechanical design consultants as opposed to going to a specialist solar thermal design build contractor, because frankly, a lot of um, mechanical consultants have very little experience with solar thermal and that's how things go wrong. Um, be really clear about what you're looking for, define the scope of work. It may make sense to do a more nuanced uh, hiring process to get the right people. And obviously, well, show me what you've done before. Give me a name of some references. Who's going to be on the project? Guarantee to me that they're going to be showing up on day one, not, not put, uh, talking about somebody and then bringing in somebody else. There's no substitute for really understanding what it is that you're going to be um, receiving. So then on the service side, we're now moving forward with, a, with a, a construction project. So that construction project needs managing. So the first thing you obviously have to do is you may have started with an energy audit with 10, light, 10 line items, and I'll block my eyes, but you may wish to take out that slice and that slice, in which case do you understand what the financial and technical impact of removing certain things is going to be? Now oh, we're not going to proceed with the exterior insulation. It's, it's just way too long a payback. Well, it's going to completely ruin all the calculations for your heating and cooling retrofits. Uh, on the tendering construction and the construction management side of things, you're going, you're in an existing facility, you're going to create noise, you're going to, get, you're going to create uh, garbage, you need, you're going to find who the consultant, it turns out the consultant went through for their lighting order but missed an entire floor because the door was locked. So you're going to need to be thinking about unit pricing, you're going to be needing to think about hours of operation, you're going to be needing to, needing to think about access, managing noise getting it finished and, and paying people, you know, have you got the provisions in your management process to make sure that every single project gets finished? And then obviously somebody's got to go through payment certification. Somebody's got to make sure that things get paid for properly. And again, back to unit rates, substitution. Did you have one extra, one less toilet? Are you able to define what that is uh, from the existing contracting process? I'm gonna talk about that uh, right now. So obviously managing construction, Communications cube, it's really straightforward. Um, what, what's the standard thing you're supposed to do in a presentation? Tell them what, what you're gonna tell them, tell them and then tell them what you just told them. We are going to be doing this super duper energy retrofit project. Next week, somebody is gonna be coming to change the light bulbs. The light bulb people are coming in tomorrow. How did the light bulb project go today? Can you see okay? Make sure that you manage that step by step. So pilot interventions let people see the results. Take an empty unit, do the retrofit that you're planning to do, 
invite everybody to come in and see what it looks like so that no one is surprised when they see similar changes coming in. Continues to communicate. A construction schedule, there's, I think I'm, I'm guilty of this. You get yourself a nice construction schedule and then you quietly, you pin it to the divider and then you never look at it again. As the um, building owner and operator, you need to make sure that the timeline that you're envisaging is being kept to and you keep phoning and people, you keep pound, pestering and hounding because every consultant and every contractor has too much work to do it's a good problem to have, but at the same time, you need to make sure that you're the squeaky wheel. <laughs> we keep communicating. And then during the construction, the commissioning of the construction. So this is something that I think is uh, via the process of actually commissioning on the new construction side, I think has been nicely defined, nicely defined uh, over recent years. So the first thing is, well, did you actually install what you were going to do? And that involves can often involve going through and spending half a day counting every single example. You know, we thought there were 48 lights. Did you do 49 or did you 47 or did you miss the one in the closet? Did the contractor forget to go upstairs? Did the tenant not let you in because of a specific concern and that unit never got done? Number two, does it work? You've got to check things and you have to check them both. Does it turn on? Does it turn off? When I hit the button on the building automation system, can somebody upstairs actually see the damper open? Do they see the damper closed? Now, the issue with building audits is that they have to function in the winter, spring, summer and fall. And so you've got to make sure that there's a process in place to ensure that um, it works in the heating as well as the cooling seasons, which brings me to holdbacks. You need to make sure that you're reasonable with your contractors and consultants, but at the same time, you need to make sure that there's a, a financial incentive for them to come back in six months time to confirm that everything is working okay. Operations and maintenance, you've got to make sure that things are documented. You've got to make sure you have as-built drawings. You've got to make sure that um, warranties have been registered. You've got to make sure you have documentation. You've got to make sure that your staff have been trained. These things often get left behind or they, they, they are left with, um, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, I've always got your phone number, whether the person leaves and then you don't have their phone number and it turns out. It turns out, one of the things, as it turns out, is that staff taking ownership of new equipment and new systems and committing to make them work can be a sort of an emotional process as well and those people are only going to accomplish that if they're given agency and understanding of the of the of the the the, uh, the schematic what does the new schematic design look like what does a new sequence of operation look like do they understand it do they understand how to implement it do they understand when to switch things over that's all I wanted to talk about this morning. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I hope that gave you a nice uh, rapid skate through of what uh, an energy uh, management and water management process might look like from your perspective. Uh, that was great, Ian, thank you. Thank I'm you. not seeing any questions uh, yet in the chat box. So feel free to post any, if anyone has uh, a question. For Ian, um, I have um, not so much a question, but uh, an ask. If you could distill uh, your presentation into sort of one or two key nuggets for the audience, do you have an idea of what those nuggets might be? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And funnily enough, it's, uh, for all of us, what we did yesterday seems to be the most important thing. So yesterday was my kickoff lecture for my master's of building science students renewable energy integration in buildings and the first thing that i kind of said to them was now you can make a building super complicated with a solar thermal preheated geo exchange system that's going to take care of your heating and cooling and you're going to have a mixture of solar hot water going into the ground and some going into your building and my comment back to them was you've got to realize that it, particularly in, in multi-unit housing, you can off the, the person on site who is the most technically adept could be no more than somebody who really is providing janitorial service and that their solution to any complaint or problem that comes up is just a list of phone numbers uh, on, on their bedroom wall because they may well live in the building that says, you know, if there's a problem with the heating call contractor, if there's a problem with the ventilation call contractor B, inflicting super complicated uh, technical solutions onto buildings like that 
can often result in, in, in disappointment on all fronts because there isn't the sophistication on the owner's side to manage those things on an ongoing basis. And I think that was definitely something true of early stage uh, green building new construction. And so my comment would be, you know, be realistic about what you can and can't take on and what you think your building, your staff and your tenants, your residents can really manage um, and, and pick that accordingly. Sometimes you can bite too much off and you just create more trouble than, than really you're able to manage. I think that would be the first one. And then the last one would be, it is really important to have a firm grasp around the process and the scope of work of what's going on because if you don't really understand what it is that you've just procured how long it's going to take and what the measurable outcomes are going to be if you haven't asked that question there's a good chance the person you've hired doesn't actually understand what it is that you're looking for either and and frankly as an external person there's actually nothing better than walking into a client that knows more than you do because they're able to immediately Okay, we're not doing this, we're not doing this, I want you to focus on this, 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 and this. It, it, it makes it much easier to recommend things that potentially could be potentially more risky or more expensive or more long term because you know that process, that person has an understanding and an agency in what you're doing. Um, I'll never forget being hired to do a, um, an, an energy audit of the Ashbridge's Bay water treatment plant. And it had gone through a slightly odd procurement process. And there we were showing up at the kickoff meeting. And the person who was in charge of the entire Toronto Water Organization said, okay, here's what's happened. Here's who was hired. Here's what we've got. It wasn't quite what I was expecting. So what I want you to do is this, 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 this. And so he was super clear. He was super defined. He understood what he wanted and he marshaled the resources. He had made sure that the money was spent in a very um, tight and defined way. And the outcome of the process was, I think, extremely good because, again, the, the client had a really good understanding of what it is that they wanted. Great. Thank you.